You were created to know and enjoy God. You were called to be in community so that you can become all that God desires you to be. God designed you with a purpose so you can be the difference in this world. And we exist to help you on that journey. Graceway. Good morning, Graceway. I'm Pastor Todd Gentleman, and this is my wife, Juliet. We are so excited you decided to log in with us for worship today. Yes, and we'll be back after the message to share some next steps with you to help you deepen your faith. Guys, the service is getting started, so come on and let's join in. been a crazy year. Uh, the pandemic was something I've told you many times. I thought a couple weeks and we'll be back to it. And, and we weren't able to meet regularly for a year. Uh, so many of you still in, in no guilt, no drama around it, still don't feel comfortable coming back. I feel like we're starting. It's starting to feel a little bit more like Graceway to me. Uh, but it's just an interesting, it's an interesting time. And uh, in COVID, uh, I, I committed that I was going to figure out what journey COVID was supposed to put me on. I hope that during times when you go through valleys and difficult, that you're, difficult seasons that you're looking for, God, what, where, am, where are you and where are you wanting me to be on this? And, and in, in, in COVID, God answered a couple of prayers that I had by giving me people who gave me the gift of disorientation. So let me explain what I mean by that. Um, I've talked to you about the gift of discomfort. This idea that people uh, in seasons uh, who create discomfort or agitation or tension have the potential to be gifts from God to you. People that you don't agree with, people who don't look like you, talk like you, vote like you, come from where you come from, believe what you believe, seasons that you feel like are going to wear you out, my counselor would say there's gold in those hills. Sometimes you just have to dig it out. The healthiest people that I know have the greatest emotional intelligence and therefore are living the nearest to their God-given capacity. They are not trying to confirm their biases. They're trying to challenge their biases. The healthiest people that I know, the, the godliest people that I know, the best leaders that I know, they're not, they're not looking for people to agree with them or tell them they're right. They're looking for people who are gonna make them better so that they can grow. But if you really wanna grow, I mean, if you, if you say to God, this is a season of growth for me, you not only have to invite discomfort, but you have to pursue people who disorient you. And here's what I mean by that. These are the kind of people that when you listen to them, when you read them, when you're around them and listen to them talk, they are so far ahead of you that you have no idea what they're saying. You know what I'm talking about? That they're saying things to you that are self-evident to them, and you're, you're like, I'm still on... B and you're on J, right? And in God's kindness to me during COVID, I've, I've had a couple people like that in my, in my life. And, and to some extent, COVID has been disorienting to me. Which, which, which end is up here? Which is right, left, and left, right? What's wrong? What's right? What's best? What's worst? And the journey that God has had me on is what I want to talk to you about today. And it's around my mind and my thinking. It's around my mind and my thinking. And, and in COVID, I committed that I wasn't, gonna, I wasn't gonna survive COVID, that I wanted to thrive in COVID, that I wanted to thrive in COVID, that I wanted to look back on COVID and say COVID was indispensable for me and for my family and for this church. I, want, I wanted COVID to be the season that when we were where we were by God's grace, we looked at COVID and said, we needed that to get here. We needed that to get here. We couldn't have gotten here without that. And some of you, that's very hard for you to get your head around, not only around COVID, but around just difficult seasons. But I will say to you that I want you to be able to look back on difficult times, COVID and otherwise, and say, by God's grace, you didn't break me. You grew me. You, you weren't done to me. You were given for me. I want you to be able to, to, to get your foot on top of those valleys and those difficulties and those confusions. And I'll tell you that, uh, that the place that has to begin is your mind. And so let me say it to this way. Do any of you feel like you have an 
ongoing argument in your own head. An, on, an ongoing argument that sometimes feel like, feels like a war and you're not sure that you're winning the battles, let alone, let alone the war. I'll just give you a couple of mine. Like, I, I, I want to be a person of faith. I, I want to have, have courageous, uh, violent faith. Yeah? But I also have fears. I want to be free. I mean, I, I want the kind of freedom that blows even my hair back. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the mustache just parts. That's what I'm looking for. I, want, I, want, I, don't, I don't want to be encumbered by somebody else's opinion of me. I don't want to be encumbered by somebody else's judgment or labeling of me. I, I want to live as God says that I am. But man, it's hard to forgive people, isn't it? It's hard. I want to trust God. I do. I, I want to trust God aggressively. I also like being in control and knowing what's coming next. I want to be confident in my calling. I want to step into anything that God has for me, but sometimes that inner, insecure, screaming voice is saying the opposite. Anyone with me? Yeah, yeah even if you're not with me, there's a guy by the name of the Apostle Paul who I think, I think was with me. Listen to Romans chapter 7. I don't understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, and I do the very thing that I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law, and that's good. So now it is long, no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that nothing dw good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I want to make some statements to you here today, and I hope you're taking good notes. Most of life's battles are won and lost in your mind. Most of life's battles are won and lost in, in your mind. Last week, when we were talking about mental health, I read a verse to you. I want to read the following verse. Here's what I read to you last week. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have the divine power to destroy strongholds. And we say yes and amen to that. Here's the next verse. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. If you want to obey Jesus, you have to win in your mind because much of our spiritual battles take place in our mind. I'm not saying that there aren't going to be things that happen outside of your mind, in your relationships, in the workplace, in culture. I believe that spiritual warfare is very, very, very real. I think angels and demons and principalities and powers are all very real. And if you don't agree with me, uh, you're disagreeing with the Bible, and just wait, okay? And, and just wait. It's, it's a real thing, but I think probably the vast majority of spiritual warfare occurs in between my ears because the enemy intends to shape my thinking. Please listen. The enemy intends to shape your thinking one thought at a time until your mind is a prison of lies, the enemy intends to shape your thinking one thought at a time until your mind is a prison of lies because he knows something that we either don't know or don't live in. He knows that our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. Our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. The life that we have right now reflects the thoughts that we think. The life that you have right now, listen, it's not about how much money you make, it's not about where you live, who you're married to, how well things are going, what it says on your business card. The life you're living happens first and fundamentally in between your ears, and you cannot live a positive life if you have a negative mind. Let me say it to you in a little bit more church language. You can't live a biblical life if you have an unbiblical mind. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12 says, don't be conformed to this world. And most of the time we fill in what we think he means by that. So be moral, have conservative theology, be ethical, do the right thing with the right people at the right time for the right reasons. But that's not what he says. He says, don't be conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. First, you have to accept that there is a battle in and for your mind you have to accept that the, the, the battle is around lies and truth. You have to see that there are lies that are showing up 
in our culture, and you have to decide by the grace of God to say those are lies and I'm going to think differently. That's how we're not conformed to this world. It's not about who you voted for. It's not about the Bible that you carry. It's not about your ethics. It's about, it's about your mind and your ability to discern what is true and what is false. And so I want to teach you, I want to really coach you in three ways to prepare your mind for spiritual warfare and for the blessing that I think that God has for you today. And I want to ask you to take good notes, and I want to ask you to pay attention, and I want to say to you, last week I said that I knew that the content was not really allowing for amens. That's not true this week. So if you agree with me, help a brother out and let me know. All right, let's practice. One, two, three. You guys are awesome. First thing that I need you to do is identify your biggest strongholds. I need you to identify, I need you to name them. I need you to say them, I need you to write them down, I need you to be very conscious because some of you are shadow boxing when it comes to spiritual warfare. I need you to know who your enemy is, and here's why. Your thoughts create neurochemical changes in your body. They shape neural pathways in your brain. Positive ones do, and negative ones do. Your brain is not static. Your brain is malleable, your brain is teachable. Before I started kind of down this path, if I was, if I was honest, I would have said, brain is like command control, it's like the navigator for your life. That's, that's actually not true. Your brain is like a child. Your brain does what you teach it to do. Your brain is shaped by what you expose it to and what you teach it implicitly and explicitly. The more often that you think a thought, the easier it is for your brain to produce that thought again, and the easier it becomes for your brain to produce the thought, the less you will validate and evaluate whether or not the thought you're thinking is true. Now listen, thoughts come into our minds, and the first time it comes up, you say, well, I don't, I don't, I don't really know if that's true. But then you think it again, and you think it again, and your brain essentially creates a stack of flashcards. I'll never be loved. I'm weak. They're stupid, right? And then a circumstance comes up, and your brain looks for the flashcard to help you define and determine what's going on, and so it puts the flashcard that you have used the most up. Now watch what happens. That flashcard goes up enough times because your brain is malleable, and you stop evaluating whether or not the flashcard is true. You stop thinking whether or not the, fla the, 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 the flashcard is true, and this is how a stronghold gets created. Pastor Andrew referenced this today when he was praying, and maybe if you've been around church, you know what that is, maybe you don't. So here's what a stronghold is. It's the lies that you believe and repeat to yourself to the point that you struggle to hear another perspective. A stronghold is the lies that you believe. Stronghold isn't out there, it's in here. The lies that you believe and repeat to yourself to the point that you struggle to hear another perspective. That you can sit in a room and hear somebody like me talking exactly to your stronghold and because you have read the flashcards so many times, you will think that might be true for you but it's not true for me. And you're stuck. Let me just give you a couple. Let me just give you a couple of phrases that go through our head. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not strong enough. My past is too bad. If you knew about my past, whew, you're always going to battle your weight. You're just not good with money. You can't really get close to God. He's not interested in it. You're never going to have a job that you love that also pays the bills. All your relationships break down. Anyone that you get close to is going to betray you. You can't trust anybody. You're never going to be loved. You're just weak and pathetic. Maybe you've heard the story. I, I honestly don't know if it's true or not, but it's this idea of how do you train an elephant. And the way you train an elephant is that if you get a baby elephant, you, you, and I'm not advocating for this, just an idea, okay? You get a baby elephant, you tie a rope around its leg, and you... you you connect the rope to a stake that it's not strong enough at that point to get away from. And what happens is that you convince the elephant that the thing that keeps them from being able to move isn't their lack of ability, it's that stake and this rope. And even though the elephant grows 
and is strong and is powerful and is capable, they are tied to something where? Not on their leg, in their mind, that keeps them from being able to break free. Here's what the Bible says, that in Jesus, you are powerful and you are free and you are victorious. That's why Pastor Andrew prays the way that he prays. He's declaring Jesus as ultimate in your hearts and he's listing things that we think compete with Jesus that don't. But some of you, you are free, you are powerful, and you are stuck to a rope and a stake called your thoughts. So let me read it to you again, okay? In order to be different, you have to think different. In order, in order to be different, not you have to do different. Do follows thoughts. In order to be different, you have to think different. Here's our text. We, do, we destroy arguments in every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive. Why? So that we can obey Christ. Now that word captive there, it's a simple Greek word. It means to capture with a spear or sword. Now, isn't it interesting then that when the Bible describes itself, it does it like this in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews 4 and verse 12, for the word of God is living and active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the... When I do this, I need you to read the next word. Dis discerning the... And intentions of your heart. We need the word of God to lay capture to our thoughts to point out whether or not our thoughts are true or are false. Listen to what Jesus said in John 8. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you, the truth will rip the stake out of the ground. So I want to give you some practices this week. These are not rhetorical. These are not anecdotal. I'm asking you if this is you to do these things. I want you to go home, I want you to get your journal or a piece of paper. Technically, I'd like you to write it, not type it. But I want you to list your strongholds. I want you to name them. I want you to say what they are. And then directly under that stronghold, I want you to write the lie that you believe in order to stay stuck. Directly under that stronghold, I want you to write the lie. Now, in order for you to do this, you're gonna have to pray because the enemy wants to keep you in the dark. He wants you to say, this is too stressful, I can't do this. This is too confusing, I can't see it. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. The word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, right? And so we pray, and then we begin to ask some questions. This stronghold and this lie, when did it start? When, when do I remember beginning to, th when do I remember the first time that flashcard went up? Who was around when I started to think it? Who's around when I think it now? How is this different from other habits that I'm able to stop? Why is this such a struggle? Why am I stuck here? And what is the real need that I feel like this lie is addressing? In the manufacturing world, Toyota has a practice every day in their facilities. <clears throat> if there's a problem, the managers get together and they do, there's a book on it. It's called Toyota's Five Whys. This is broken and they answer, why did it break? Why did that break? Why did that break? Why did that break? Why did this break? It's actually a very spiritually discerning practice. This is my stronghold. This is the lie. Why do I believe it? Why do I believe that? Why do I believe that? And what we ask the Holy Spirit to do is to shed light on where I'm stuck. Why? So I can rip that stake out of the ground. Now once I identify the lie, I then have to go to God's word and identify what is true and begin to embrace it. And I say begin because in church world we think, oh, just stop doing it and then you're fine. That's not how it works, is it? If that's how it worked, I would just tell you what to do or somebody you trust would tell you what to do and you would do it and we would all look more like Jesus, but we're all stuck somewhere. 
And so I'm identifying the lie and then I'm saying, here is the truth, God, I want to, I desire to, the intention of my heart is to embrace and apply this truth to my life. Why? Because I don't want to stay locked in a prison that Jesus holds the keys to. And I will tell you that for some of you, the reason that you're stuck is that you don't want to be unstuck enough. I'm not trying to be rude to you, but some of you, I, I say some of these things and I give you some of these principles and you're just, your face is just completely blank. You do not have the countenance of somebody who wants to be free. You don't have the countenance of somebody who says, no matter what happens, I'm not staying here. And I will tell you that because spiritual warfare is real and because our enemy is powerful, that unless you bring intentionality to it, you will just cope with and get stuck in the dysfunction that is livable to you. And most Christians that I know are there. Eh, eh. But, but we just celebrated Easter. <laughs> Pastor Andrew comes up and we get all hyped about these strongholds and Jesus is and all. But is he going to be tomorrow? Is, is he going to be in the areas that you are stuck, that you are tied to a stake that is a lie? You're going to have to decide. I'm going to teach you how. You're going to have to decide. I'm not staying here. I'm not staying here. Are you with me? So two things that I want to teach you today. I want to teach you, number one, to defeat your negative thoughts. Okay, we're going to have to learn the difference between facts and our filters. We're going to have to learn the difference between our facts and our filters. It's called cognitive bias. Cognitive bias is the mistakes that we make in our reasoning based on personal experience or preference. For some of you, it's like I'm sitting in your living room listening to you talk to your spouse. Why would you say that? Uh, because I just wanted you to pass the ketchup. <laughs> Why'd you say it like that all the time? You're so rude. I'm sick of it. What? What's happening? Your reasoning is connected to the past and to preferences and in hurts and in traumas to the point that you're, you're both walking on eggshells. <laughs> and, and so I read my assumptions into, into my circumstance. This happens in the Bible. N Numbers 13 and 14, Moses sends 12 spies to explore the promised land. Now, just some simple questions here. Why is it called the promised land? Because what? Who promised it? God promised it. It's literally in the title. I mean, this is the easiest test of all, of all time, right? It's called the promised land because it was promised by God. And do you think that, that Moses picked the least godly, lowest scoring on the test leaders to go? No. I think that he picked people who knew what God had said. People that loved God, people that believed God, people who had good theology, people that had a good testimony. Will you, will you give me that? So they go into the promised land, and of 12, 10 of them say, we can't do it. Now, can you picture Moses? What, 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 what do you mean, we can't do it? And here's their response. They have giants. They have what? They have big, strong guys with weapons that we don't have we can't, we can't beat them. Two guys come back and say, not about the giants, they talk about how great the promise in the land was. They're looking at the same thing, and they come back with two different stories. Now this is interesting, because almost 84% of the people who come back from looking at the same thing say, mm -mm. and I think that's still about right. I think that still about 84% of us look at the promises of God, but then when we see a circumstance go, did you see how big and scary that was? What I'm trying to say to you is that uh, I think that not that many of us regularly live in the 16%. I don't. I, I, I don't. Are you with me? Just me? Yeah, I, I think it's 84% then and 84% now. And so I read this book, and I, I came across this phrase that I think is a very biblical phrase. It's this. It's neutral thinking. Neutral thinking. How many of you have heard of positive thinking? Yeah, just, just think positively, right? So neutral thinking, it's not pessimistic. It's not negative. It's not passive. 
and it's not, it's not positive. Neutral thinking is open thinking. It's, it's actually curious thinking. So, oh, I wonder, here's why. Because you can't control what you face or what happens to you. You, you cannot control that. You know that, right? If you could stop the COVID thing, could you meet me down front afterward? No, we, we, we are told that we can control things that we can't. We can't control what we face, but you can control how you think about or frame it. This is not passively receiving information and circumstance, which is what most of us do. Most of us, we watch TV and we passively receive. Most of us, we scroll and we passively receive. This is why I beg you to stop watching so much news, because most of us just have the news on in the background and we're passively believing without evaluation whatever the talking head is saying. And it's destructive. It's incredibly destructive. So this is not passively receiving. This is actively interpreting. This is why a couple weeks ago I taught you, go home, and if you watch the Masters, watch the commercials, and ask yourself, what truth are they trying to communicate to you? They're trying to tell you you're going to be manly if you have this truck. Your kids are going to love you if you have this detergent. You're going to be sexy if you wear these earrings. May or may not be true, I'm just saying. So neutral thinking, then, is something that the Apostle Paul became a master at. The Apostle Paul was a master at neutral thinking. In Philippians chapter 1, listen to this phrase. The Apostle Paul is in prison. Not a white-collar prison, (laughs) okay? A Roman prison. And listen to his explanation. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Now think about this. If the Apostle Paul was speaking negatively, pessimistically, cynically, it would have sounded like this. I swear, if this happens one more time, every time I try to serve God, I end up in a place like this. Why would he abandon me when I'm trying to do the right thing? If it were positive, it would have sounded like, these chains are actually reasonably comfortable. (laughs) And the guard smells like he has a new cologne, and I don't hate it. And if he were passive, it would have said, oh well, I guess we'll see what happens which is where I think most Christians live. Oh well, we'll see what happens. So I wanna teach you how to address your negative thoughts. I wanna teach you how to think neutrally. Are you still with me? I want you to learn to practice pre-framing. Practice pre-framing. One of my favorite experiences in my travels, Ash and I had the chance to go to the Louvre. Um, I love art. My mom was an art major. I was very close to going to art school. Uh, And the Louvre is the epicenter of the art world. And everything on the property, I mean, you get off of the tram and you step onto the Louvre and everywhere you look, it's, it's it's a piece of art. It's art on top of art on top of art. It is intended to accentuate the pieces that you're there to see, and it works. I actually, I actually sat and I watched people walk down the hall to look at the Mona Lisa, and it was like time after time after time because it was being done on purpose. There's somebody whose job it is, it's called the curator, the the job is to frame the experience for the intended outcome. Are you with me? It's amazing what the right frame does for a piece of art. Can you imagine the Mona Lisa with like the frame that your kid made in kindergarten with with the popsicle sticks? Are you with me? And you went up to it and like, uh, but I've seen the Mona Lisa, and the frame is as pretty as the picture. That's the point. Somebody, somebody curated it. Somebody planned the experience. And what I'm saying to you is that you need to learn how to curate your mind. You need to learn to choose the frame before you enter the experience. So here's how this works. I'm going to go to work tomorrow, and I'm sideways with my boss. No matter what happens, here's the frame. No matter what happens, no matter what he or she says, no matter what he or she does, I am going to work as unto my real boss, the Lord. No matter what. 
That's the frame you walk in with. Now, many of us, we walk in negatively. If that dude says one more thing to me, one of us is going to the morgue and one of us is going to jail. Right? Or we walk in positively. I love my job. It's going to be so great. And then you get to the end of the day and you're like, I hate my life. Or we walk in passively. Eh, I don't know, man. I'm tired of this. We'll see what happens. Nope. I'm going to curate my mind. I'm going to curate. I'm going to pre-frame my mind. I'm not going to react. I'm not going to be controlled by their actions or their reactions. Many of us struggle with the thoughts in our mind because they aren't our thoughts. They're somebody else's. And we just let them in. Okay, we, just, we just let them in. And we maul somebody else's actions and somebody else's thoughts, and we're always reacting. And we're wondering why our soul feels like it's, it's coming apart. And so I want you to begin to preframe. And you're going to be amazed how well this works. I have a handful of friends who are CEOs, just big-time leaders. And I will tell you, the difference between high-end CEOs and everybody else is this. CEOs spend more time thinking about what could happen and what they're going to do if it happens than anybody I've ever met. If this happens, I'll do this, and then this, and then this, and then this. It's why they always look like they know what's coming next, because they've done this. Now, you'll be amazed how well this works, but sometimes, I'll be honest with you, it doesn't. Sometimes, I have a frame around an interaction, and somebody hops out of the frame. You know what I'm saying? Now, I don't want you to get floored by this. I want you to stay neutral, and here's a great test to know whether or not you're neutral. If you can thank God for what didn't happen. If you can thank God for what didn't happen, another way of saying it is, in any circumstance, I'm going to, I'm going to look for the goodness of God. And here's what I will tell you. You'll be amazed how often you find what you're looking for. How many of you have ever thought to yourself, I need to buy a new car? And you decide you're going to buy whatever kind of car, and then everywhere you go, you see that car. Have you had that happen before? What's happening? No, you're just looking with intentionality for something. And so many of us in our lives, the goodness of God is all around us, the faithfulness of God is all around us, but we have trained our brain for the flash card of, yeah, but what about this? And so I wanna pre-frame according to what is true, I wanna decide with conviction before I have to respond and react, and when it goes sideways, I'm gonna look for the goodness of God so that I can step into opportunities instead of being stuck in challenges. Whenever I'm, pre I'm prepared in my mind, whenever I'm looking for the goodness of God, you're gonna see opportunities. Listen, there's lots of opportunities in COVID. There's lots of opportunities in economic downturn. There's lots of opportunities in racial tension. There's op lots of opportunities in an election year if you're looking for the right thing. But some of us were stuck in challenges, not because they aren't there, because we're stuck in our mind. And I will tell you, I didn't say this in the first service, but I was thinking about it in between. Some of you are like, why, when am I gonna have the time to do all this? And that's why we started at embracing your limitations. Some of you, you're not taking a Sabbath, you're not spending time with life-giving people, so you don't think you have time to do this, so you're constantly reacting. If you will live according to how God says to live, with the right pace and the right people, you will have the time to do this. But if you refuse to do it God's way, listen, you will regularly be tied to things that are much weaker than your capacity because you're stuck in your mind. Number three, are you still with me? Yeah. Number three, I want you to train your mind. So I want you to name your strongholds, I want you to, to defeat your negative thinking, and then I want you to train your mind. Now training your mind is very similar to training your body. Here's what I mean by that. You can't outwork McDonald's. Some of you are like, wait, what? <laughs> you can't outwork a bad diet. And you can't outdecide a bad thought life. Why? Because the gravity of your thoughts will always pull you down. The gravity of your thoughts will always win. And so you're gonna to have to be intentional about what you put into your mind. You say, where's that in the Bible? I'm glad you asked, thank you. Philippians four and verse eight. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, 
And I love this because you can hear God beating us to the punch. If there's anything excellent, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on these things. I want you to think of this as stocking the shelves of your mind. Stocking the shelves of your mind. You remember the toilet paper thing in COVID? You remember walking? You remember realizing you have one roll left? And in panic, you go to the grocery store and you turn the aisle and there's nothing on all the shelves. I literally had to walk my kids out of two aisles listening to an adult freak out on the stock person in the grocery store. I, there was one guy, he started to yell, what am I supposed to do? Like, you don't have any, and I remember this, this teenage kid looked at the adult who was losing his mind and said, bro, I can't give you what I don't have. Think on things that are true and virtuous and praiseworthy. You can't think on things that you haven't stocked the mind with. You don't have a, enough supply. It's the reason why the lightest nudge puts you in a tailspin, because you don't have enough inventory. Are you with me? And so you need to develop, and just let me, let me explain, okay, because I know some of you are going to, mm, I knew it. You need to develop the discipline of meditation. Okay, now, if you're going to send me an email about what I just said, add this next line. Don't let the world steal God's idea from you. Psalm 19, let the words of my mouth and the of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Psalm 119 and verse 15, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. In fact, Psalm 119, the famous text talking about David's love for God's word, eight times he talks about meditating on God's word. Psalm 143 and verse five, I remember the days of old, I will meditate on all that you have done, I ponder the work of your hands. Now watch. This kind of new age Eastern meditation thing, the aim of that is to empty your mind. That's not biblical meditation. Biblical meditation is to engage your mind in mental practice, filling your mind and focusing your thoughts. Now watch, I always wanna point out how I think the enemy works on these things. I believe that the enemy knows that there's power in your mind and there's power when your mind is filled up with and focused on truth. So of course he's going to come up with a counterfeit way of meditating. Of course. Because he knows that the aim is to fill up. There's going to be another way of emptying, of stripping the shelf of your mind of all life-giving, positive, and true thoughts. And what's maddening is that the church just hears the punchline, freaks out, meditation is wrong and unbiblical, or worse yet, they do it the world's way. So watch, God instructs us to regularly meditate on what is true, not to empty our mind, to fill our mind, to stock the shelves of our mind with his truth, with his thoughts, so that when we need it, it is there for us to participate in. Now, training the mind is learning how to focus the mind. Focus the mind on what is true. And over the past few years, I have asked you, really almost begged you, <laughs> to get into a small group <clears throat> and to read the Bible together every single year. I've asked you every single day to invest yourself in hearing from God. We've literally done the 555 plan. Read your Bible for five minutes, pray for five minutes, listen to worship music for five minutes. I'm literally asking for 15 minutes out of every single day. Two weeks ago, I had somebody come down to the front. She lives out of town now, but she used to come to this church and she watches us every week. And she says, one week I was listening to you and you said, uh, don't send me an email about theology if you're not reading your Bible every day. I was like, ugh. <laughs> and she said, so I, so I have something for you. I go, you got an email for me? And she said, no. I, uh, I started doing the 555 thing. And she goes, now it's much more than 555. And she started to cry. And she said, it's completely changed my life. 
And so I do, I do want to say, this is important, and it's a little bit of a zinger, but it is amazing to me the amount of people in the church who want to argue about the Bible but don't regularly study or read it. it it's amazing to me. I, I would love to be able to tell my admin, hey, I, I'll talk theology. I love theology. Did you read your Bible today? <laughs> because we have to be people of the book. Okay. But reading your Bible is not about checking a box. The reason it's not working is because our perspective on it is I'm checking a box so that God's happy. That's not what reading your Bible is about. Reading your Bible is filling your mind every day in the acknowledgement that at the end of the day, your mind goes blank and you wake up foggy. It's the reason you stumble to the coffee pot, right? Oh, I got to... You, you acknowledge around caffeine that you need to fill yourself up with something. So I'm asking you to, on the same hand, say, every day I wake up and my mind is empty and I want to fill it up with God's word. Okay? I want you to fill it up with God's word, fill it up with God's presence, fill it up with God's people. But more than that, I want, I want you to fill it and I want you to focus it. Here's the next step. I want, I want you to fill it and then I want you to begin to focus it, which means this. I want you to write it. I want you to think it. I want you to say it until you believe it. I want you to write it, not type it, not the same. Think it, meditate on it, say it, declare it, until you believe it. That's the recipe. So there's two pieces, and we're almost done. I want you to be reading your Bible every single day. If I could have my druthers, you would be in a small group, you'd be reading the Bible together, you'd be talking about what God's teaching you. I want you to pray every single day. I want you to worship God every single day. Why? Because at the end of the day, you're either wiped out or you're blanked out. And you need filled up with God's truth and with God's spirit every single day. Next is I want you to begin to memorize it. I want you to begin to memorize the Bible. Now, this is, this is so old school that a lot of us have stopped doing it. But what is memorizing it? It's stocking the shelves of your heart. Unless you're going to walk around with a Bible and flip to... You're going to have to stock the shelves of your heart with what God says is true. You say, what should I memorize? You should go back to your strongholds, and you should put God's truth right under that lie. And you should write it. Don't type it. It's different. Write it. Meditate on it. Say it out loud again and again and again and again and again until your brain knows to put that flashcard out. Until your brain knows, oh, this is a big deal. Oh, you think this is true. <laughs> and watch what will happen. Once you get to this spot, what will happen is not confirmation of lies, but confirmation of what is true. Because that lie has been replaced, and so your brain will know to hold up that flashcard, and you go, oh, there's God. Oh, there's the faithfulness of God. Oh, there's the, oh, God's everywhere. And God's like, I, I, I tried to tell him. <laughs> so I want you to memorize and then I want you to do some, some daily declarations in fact how I want to end the service is I'm going to have you stand up and I'm going to declare eight things over you and then I'm going to pray for you and we're going to go up and party like we're 78 years old alright are you with me? Yeah. Okay. God would you allow us to receive these things as true from your word and from your spirit Eight things. You are strong and you are mighty. You have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwelling inside of you. You are a weapon of righteousness in a world of darkness. You are not your past. You are not your past. You are not your past. You are not what you did. You are not what they say you are. You are who God says you are. And he says that you are forgiven. He says that you are redeemed. He says that you are free. You are not a hostage to your unhealthy thoughts. The weapons you fight are not the weapons of this world. You have the divine power to demolish strongholds. You have the mind of Christ directing your thoughts. You have the word of God guiding your steps. Worry is not your master. You trust in God. His peace guards your heart. 
It guards your mind and it guards your soul in Christ Jesus. Your God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The Lord is your helper. You will not be afraid. You are not a slave to your habits. You are not a prisoner to addiction. You have been rescued from the power of darkness and brought into the kingdom of God's light. Nothing can separate you from God's love. Not demons, not death, not depression, not discouragement, not disappointment, not despair. Not the present, not the past. No power on earth will ever separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God, we say yes and amen to these things. We say that you are the author and the finisher of our faith. We say that you are greater and that we desperately need you. God, we ask you in your kindness and in your grace to point out our strongholds. God, we want to be free. We ask you, God, that you would give us a posture of curiosity, wondering what you're up to, wondering where you're going, wondering where you're leading us. We ask you, God, to fill up our hearts with what is true. Fill up our minds with your spirit. Fill up this church with your presence, God. Allow us to meditate on what is true. God, we aren't who they say we are. You aren't who they say you are. You are who you say you are. You say that we are your sons and that we are your daughters and that we are free and that we are victorious and that we are loved and that we are purposeful. So God, we rely on what you say is true and we ask you, God, to fill us up so that we can declare not only to our own hearts but to the world who you are and what you say is true and good and right and best. So we love you today, God. Change our minds. Strengthen our minds. Give us eyes to see and give us ears to hear and let it be for your glory, God, and for our joy. We love you and pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's give thanks this morning, y'all. Come on, let's sing this last song with all we got. Do you feel the world's broken? And do you feel the shadows deepen? But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. And do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. It's all creation groaning. And there's a new creation coming. And there's a glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst. It is, yeah. And is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is, yes it is. Come on church, sing it out. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to bring the seal? He'd open the scroll. He is the light of Judah. Who conquered the grave? He is David, true and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Come on, is he worthy? Is he worthy of our blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? Well, tell him. Us. And the 
praise Jesus, our Messiah. Oh, forever those she loves. He does Guys, thank you so much for logging in with us and worshiping with us today. We're so excited to have you here. Uh, guys, if you're looking for an opportunity to get more involved here at Graceway and to find out more about who God has made you to be, we have a great opportunity with you to join us for Growth Track. Growth Track is happening on demand anytime where you're at. You can follow the link on the screen to get plugged in today. Yes, and we would also love to give you the opportunity to meet some new people, make some new friends around Graceway. And you can do that by joining a small group. You can follow the link on the screen, scroll through all of the groups, and choose one that's right for you. Also, we just want to thank you for your continued generosity and giving. Your giving helps to fund the many life-changing ministries happening here at Graceway. To continue to give today, you can also follow the link on the screen. And guys, if you want to connect or pray with a pastor today, you can call or text 816-423-2877. While we're talking about prayer, let's go ahead and pray right now together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for God, the words that were heard today, God, the songs that were sung, God, the things that you have spoken to us today, God, I pray that we would uh, not forget them quickly, but hold on to them. And God, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you use all these things to transform us and to shape us to look more and more like your son, Jesus. God, would you uh, transform us and allow us to be uh, transforming agents in the world, to be points of light to the people around us. God, to share your love with those who desperately need us. So God, uh, empower us today, send us from where we are, and God, bring us back here next week to continue uh, to love, to serve, and to worship Jesus. We ask all these things in his precious name and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you so much for joining us today. Don't forget to like and share this message. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.